you want to turn your Bibles to uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and then also Psalm 127. <clears throat> In his recent uh, presidential campaign, Rick Santorum often quoted um, a book entitled Our Kids, the American Dream in Crisis. He spoke about a topic that few candidates did, and that is the breakdown of the American family. The author of this book is Robert Putnam, a a liberal Harvard professor who nevertheless says that in the book that in the 1950s, when um, people became pregnant out of wedlock, 80% eventually married and became parents to the children they conceived. Today, however, he says, men in low-income America are often impregnating many women, not marrying any of them, and not being a father figure to any of the children. And while many single parents today are doing the very best that they can to raise their children, the statistics tell us that on the average, Children raised in single-parent homes struggle more in school, they struggle more in life, have more trouble with the law, eventually make less income than do children from uh, homes with two stable parents. In an article entitled The Purpose of the Family, Kurt Bruner writes, and I'm quoting here, we know artists by their most important creations, Michelangelo by his painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, Beethoven by his Fifth Symphony, Handled by his Hallelujah Chorus, George Lucas by the Star Wars movies, and more. Every masterpiece, he says, reveals something about its creator. The same is true of God. The family is designed by God to provide a safe place where children can experience the love of God through their parents and then also learn how to love other people. He says the family reveals the character of God like nothing else in all of creation. Even Christ himself was born within the context of a family. We've learned the last two weeks that the the foundation of any construction is the most important part of that building. The foundation of our lives is the most important part of our lives. You get the foundation right, and everything else has the potential to be right. Get the foundation wrong, and nothing else can even possibly be right. We've learned that two essentials for building a strong foundation in life are, first of all, a total trust and faith in God. That is is ultimate. And then secondly, we must have a laser-like focus on making God's priorities for our lives our priorities for our lives. And so today, we're going to see why the family is so important to our life's foundation. Ephesians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19, Paul writes, So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, Jews and Gentiles, we are his house built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his Spirit. Now, if you turn with me to uh, Psalm chapter 127, verse 1. Unless the Lord builds a house, the work of the builders is wasted. Let's go to verse 3. Children are a gift from the Lord. They are a reward from him. Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hands. How joyful is the man whose quiver is full of them. If you take out your outline there on the inside of your bulletin, let's first of all, the, the family is God's agent for reproduction. Pretty obvious. Physically speaking, the family unit was created by God, not government. And God gave the family its purpose. And so when we go back to the beginning, we read in Genesis that when God created human beings, he made them male and female. He blessed them. He commanded them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the earth with human people and rule over it. Would every marriage between a husband and a wife 
Uh, Result in children? No. Would every husband and wife want children? No, they wouldn't. But having children doesn't define whether a marriage is successful or faithful or anything else. But, as Peter Sprigg writes in the Christian Post magazine, and I'm quoting here, marriage is defined as the union of a woman and a man because it brings them together for the natural reproduction of the human race, which is possible uh, only, without, or is impossible without the contribution of both sexes. And he goes on to say that an activity which could result in the birth of a child, that activity should be limited to a lifelong marriage commitment between a man and a woman. Why? Because such a relationship maximizes the the possibility that a child will be raised in a stable setting by two people responsible for that child's birth. Will it be a perfect setting? No. But it is within the context of a family that God has provided the basic ingredients that are needed to nurture and mature a child. Now the family is also God's primary agent for the spiritual reproduction of human beings. When the Jewish leader Nicodemus appeared and approached Jesus in the night and asked Jesus if he was sent from God, Jesus answered, listen. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Nicodemus is like, well, how can someone who is already born, how can someone who is old, how can they enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus said, listen carefully. You know, kind of like what we talked about last week, look at me in the eyes. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. The Apostle John says the same thing. To all who receive Jesus and believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not through a physical birth resulting from human passion or human plan, but a birth that comes from God. Rick Warren says there are only two ways to get into a family. You can either be born into it or you can be adopted into it. And God does both of those for us. Make no mistake about it, God is responsible for our human fleshly birth and God is responsible for our divine spiritual rebirth. God places us both in an earthly family and then for those who choose him, he places us In a spiritual family, a heavenly family, he calls the church. Now you would think that with the internet and cell phones and Facebook and FaceTime and LinkedIn and Skype and Twitter and texting and more and more satellites going up into the sky all the time and millions more miles of fiber optics being buried in the ground all the time, you would think that we would be more connected than we have ever been in history. And yet, more and more people are expressing the fact they feel disconnected at home, at work, at school, in their neighborhoods. I mean, think about this. We can bank online, we can shop online, we can communicate through an electronic device Why we can close our garage doors without even getting out of the car, and yet we rarely have time to greet our neighbors. People were not made for isolation. God said it is not good for man to be alone. And so God created the family not just for multiplying the human race, but for also alleviating our human aloneness. Unfortunately, all too often we get our priorities mixed up because we spend our life pursuing the material things and awards that don't satisfy us while neglecting the family relationships God designed to satisfy us. But God takes it a step further. Not only does he create the family unit for for this purpose, but When we commit our lives to him, he places us in another family, a heavenly family. He calls the church. The Apostle Paul writes, God's family 
is the church of the living God, which is the, the pillar and the foundation of his truth. N.T. Wright reminds us in his book entitled Simply Christian, and I quote, the church is first and foremost a community. We are a collection of people who belong to one another because we belong to God. Because God is our Father, we are brothers and sisters. Though we often use the word church to denote a building, it is actually only the, only the building where this community of believers, this church fellowship, meets. And Rick Warren adds, and I quote, none of us can fulfill God's purposes by ourselves. The Bible says we are put together, we are joined together, we are built together, we are members together, we are heirs together, we are fitted together, we are held together. Eventually, someday we will be caught up together to meet the Lord in the air and forever be with Him and with each other. And so one of the purposes of of the family and of the church is to help people with their feeling of disconnectedness. And I'm telling you, the weekly worship is hardly the time when we're going to develop those deep relationships. We all need some kind of meaningful study time, and prayer time, and service time with each other, with our brothers and sisters in Christ outside of this gathering so that we can get to know each other. Can anybody say, go groups? You've heard of those, right? Second, the family is God's instrument for duplication. The Minnesota Crime Commission released a report several years ago. It's very blunt. I'm, I'm, I'm warning you ahead of time. <laughs> they concluded, and I'm, I quote here now, these are not my words, they concluded, every baby starts life as a little savage. Wow. <laughs> he is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants when he wants it, a bottle of the mother's attention, his playmate's toy, his uncle's watch, etc. Deny these, and the baby sees with rage and aggressiveness all children, not just certain children, are born delinquent if permitted to continue in the self-centered world of infancy, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, or a rapist. Really? Does that sound exaggerated? Well, what happened in the very first family? Cain is like a little kid, jealous because God accepted his brother Abel's sacrifice over Cain's sacrifice. He got so angry, he took his brother's life. Through the prophet Jeremiah, God makes this convicting statement, the human heart is the most deceitful of all things. It is desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad the heart is? In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 3, the apostle Paul writes that before we found our way to Jesus Christ, before, okay, he says we all followed the, the desires and thoughts of our evil nature. Because of the evil nature that we were born with, we were subject to God's wrath just like everyone else, Paul says. David writes, surely I was sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now I get it, babies look cute and innocent. I had four. They look cute and innocent at times. Wonderful and adorable. But there were other times when Boy, they demonstrate the existence of that sinful nature. And unless that, that evil nature is, is tamed and, and trained by parents, it's going to show up later in the toddler's behavior, in the teenager's behavior. And yes, if it's not checked, it will show up when they become adults. And unfortunately, there are far too many children today either receiving no moral guidance or worse yet, Influenced in bad ways by self-centered evil adults. And that's precisely why Jesus told Nicodemus, we have to be born again. Paul said in Romans chapter 6 
The sinful nature that all of us were born with symbolically dies in the watery grave of baptism. He goes on to say, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The, the old nature that we were born with dies and a new person shows up. A new nature that wants to please God is on the scene. And consequently, when that happens, Paul says, now offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the evil thinking and behavior of this world. Let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and perfect and pleasing will. God's will is always right. God's ways are always right, whether we understand them or not. Cornelius was a well-known Roman centurion who nevertheless feared the God of Israel. He regularly prayed to the God of Israel. He oftentimes demonstrated a godly influence in his own life by generously helping other people. Cornelius would become the first non-Jew, the first Gentile to become a Christian. So God sent Peter to tell Cornelius what he needed to do to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And by the time Peter arrives in Caesarea, Cornelius has gathered his entire family, his entire household, all of his servants, to listen. And he says to Peter, we're all here. In the presence of God, for the purpose of listening to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. We're all here. We're ready to listen. And I'm telling you, our nation and our world needs more families who have the attitude of Cornelius. We're all here. Our family's here. Ready to listen to whatever it is, God, you tell us to do. Moses reminded Israel's parents to first love God with all of their hearts. Memorize the word of God. Hide it in your own heart. And then Moses said, once you've done that, impress these commandments on your children. Talk about these commandments when your children get up in the morning. Talk about these commandments when your children go to bed at night. Write God's commandments on the doorframe of your houses, on your forehead. Make sure that these commandments are everywhere so your kids can see them. We still need families to do that today. Jesus said, I've come to save you. I've come to set you free. I, I've come to show you what absolute living is really all about. Learn from me, Jesus said. I have set for you an example. I've shown you how to live. Now, now follow my example. Do for others as I have done for you. The way we make disciples of Jesus Christ is to first follow Jesus, imitate Jesus in our own lives, and then we teach Jesus' commandments to our children. We demonstrate for them on a, on a daily basis how Jesus' life looks in ours. If you've got elementary kids, I know Troy has got a challenge back there, 553. For the next three months over the summer, read five stories in five days over the next three months. As I as I observe some of the things that I see some of your families doing today, I think, man, I wish, I wish I would have done that. So many things that I would do differently. But Kyle Eidelman writes in his book entitled Not a Fan, and I'm quoting here, the supreme act of family love is to set your heart on Christ. Moms and dads, grandpas and grandmas, get it right with Jesus first. When Jesus, he says, is truly my Lord, I am at my best as a husband, a father, and a friend. We like to say family is everything, but it isn't until Jesus is our everything that we discover everything family can be. And what's true of our individual families is also true of our church family. Solomon says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Paul wrote the New Testament, even as 
uh, bad company can corrupt good morals. So wholesome character and right character and godly character serves as a spiritual light to people who went out of the darkness. In the early church, the people of God studied together. They ate together. They communed together. They prayed together. They cared for one another. And if you go back and, and look in Acts chapter 2, because they, they had this kind of relationship with one another, people were being saved every day. Every day day why because people wanted to be a part of a fellowship like that and i'm telling you that when we get it right when we live and when we love like jesus people will beat our doors down to be in here thirdly the family is our mean our means our means for God's exaltation. What is our purpose in life? Why do we exist? The Apostle Paul wrote in, in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, we are God's handiwork. Get this, you and I are God's masterpiece. He looks at us and he says, yeah, I can put my signature to that person. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. So Paul says whether you, you eat or drink, whatever it is you're doing in life, whatever it is, do it for the glory of God. In the Old Testament, David said, we are to give unto the Lord the glory that is due his name. That's why we exist. We exist not to make money. We exist not to make a name for ourselves. We exist solely to bring glory to God. And one of the ways I know we can bring glory to God is by bringing people to God. Jesus said we're supposed to be disciple makers. Our marriages exist to make disciples. Our families exist to make disciples. Our church family exists to make disciples. That's why we're here. Francis and Lisa Chan uh, wrote in a book that they authored together entitled You and Me Forever, and I quote, you don't want to stand before God at the end of your life with no disciples. We exist to influence others for God. So if influencing others for God brings Him glory, and doing so requires reprioritizing our schedules or our finances or whatever, then we need to get her done. We need to get her done, folks. I'm telling you, the world needs Christian people and Christian families to get our act together ASAP. Chan also writes, and I'm, I'm quoting here, picture a nice house with a white picket fence and your happy family lounging inside. Now imagine a full-scale war unfolding just a few blocks away. Your friends and neighbors are fighting for their lives while you are remodeling your kitchen and hanging your new big screen TV. You have contractors installing better windows so you can tune out all the noise. We can't live like that. Jesus said, I am the true vine. I, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. He didn't say some. Produce much fruit. And when you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. And this brings great glory to my Father when you're producing much fruit. Making disciples of Jesus Christ is fruit-bearing. And the home, both our individual families as well as this church family, continues to be the best place to make disciples. Let me give you a couple of examples from Scripture. You remember Ruth? Uh, Ruth was a Moabite who had grown up following some false pagan religion. But she married into a godly Jewish family, uh, so much so that when her husband died, and her mother-in-law, Naomi, decided to move from Moab back to her homeland of Israel. 
Ruth preferred to go back to Israel where she didn't know anybody, but she wanted to go back to Israel with Naomi because she was attracted to Naomi. There was something about Naomi's character fruit that was a magnet to, for Ruth. And interestingly enough, Ruth later remarried. She gave birth to a son named Jesse who fathered a son named David who was the ancestor of the king of kings, Jesus Christ, because Ruth, or Naomi, dared to live the principles of God. Another example is found in Acts when the apostles instructed the church to select seven men to take care and serve the widows. Philip was chosen by his peers for that task. Now the Bible tells us that Philip was a highly effective preacher. He performed many great miracles. So not a lot of people knew about him. But perhaps his greatest evangelistic work was what Philip and his wife did together with their children because Acts 21 and verse 8 tells us they had four daughters who were great Bible teachers. There was something about Philip's life and his wife's life they, they passed on to their kids in spite of the fact that he was doing all of these other wonderful things. Regardless of how society wants to minimize the home, the family continues to be the primary building block of a society. As, as the family goes, so the society goes. And the individual family and the family of God can still change a society today. I believe that with all my heart. Matthew Murray, age 24, was homeschooled by a deeply religious family. His father was a neurologist leading researcher on um, multiple sclerosis. Matthew Murray had participated in Youth with a Mission. Many of you are familiar with that uh, organization. They, had a, they have a 12-week training program. And he had participated in that in the year 2002, but he was dismissed and released from the program before he completed it due to some health reasons. Well, in December of 2007... Matthew Murray, by now, has got so much anger built up. So hateful toward Christians. That at 12.30 a.m. in December of 2007, he enters this youth with a mission headquarters, and people are staying overnight there. And he shoots four people, killing two of them. gets into his car and drives 65 miles to Colorado Springs. Twelve hours later, he enters into the New Life Church where approximately 7,000 people are in and around the building with a rifle and two handguns. He unloads 40 shots into the building, killing two more and th wounding three others. A volunteer security guard named Gina Assam shot Murray. And in doing so, Brady Boyd, the senior minister, credited her with saving at least, he said, a hundred lives. But that's not the rest of the story. The senior minister, Brady Boyd, invited the Murray parents to come to the church and see where their son had passed away. After showing the Murrays around and the church and where the tragic events took place, he took them into his office where they met the Works family, whose two teenage daughters were the ones killed by the Murray's son. The two families immediately embraced and wept and prayed together. The Murray family expressed their sorrow to the Works family. The Works family ministered to the Murray family. Pastor Boyd said, and I'm quoting here, what happened there in the two hours in my office was the most significant ministry moment I've ever experienced in my whole life. When, when Jeannie asked him the the security guard who had shot Matthew Murphy, when she came into the office and joined them, Matt Murray's parents got up 
embraced her. The father apologized to her that his son had put her in the position of having to make the choice that she did. And Pastor Boyd concluded, and I'm quoting again, we can talk philosophically about forgiveness and repentance and redemption and going forward with God, but what I saw in my office was the greatest testimony that God really can restore and redeem. I'm here to tell you this morning the world doesn't get it. When Jesus Christ is given access into our hearts, when you and I let him there, he then begins to change the way we think. And when we change the way we think, it impacts the way we live and behave, does it not? And as it impacts and changes the way we live and the way we behave, that is a better deal for our marriages, our families, and frankly, for an entire society. And the world doesn't understand that. The church, this is a quote, the church is the single great river formed from tens of thousands of scattered tributaries called families. People of every race, geographical, and cultural background were invited to join Jesus. And the church exists for mission, to announce to the world that Jesus is its Lord. This is the good news. And when the good news is announced, what happens? It transforms people and societies. And that's why after the resurrection, Jesus approached his disciples. Then he's still approaching us today, and he says, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. To those who still have children at home, let us resolve to build a God-fearing family that not only honors the Lord, but testifies to the Lord. For those of us whose children are gone, whose children are old and have left the home, let us resolve to open our lives, to open our homes, to open our schedules, to open our resources, to invite others to be a part of our lives, to honor the Lord and, and testify that He is indeed good. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, do not, do not let us hear this message and leave this place the same way we were when we came in. There are children out there who need to know love. There's a world out there that needs to know you. Break our hearts for that which breaks your heart. Because every day we come in contact with people whose lives are hurting and they haven't a clue how to get out or what to do. So God, thank you for the family that you've given to each of us and thank you for this family, this, this church family that you've blessed us with. But God, help us not to be selfish. Rather, to ensure that others experience what we have experienced in Jesus. So when we leave this place today, may we do so armed with your truth, ready to do spiritual warfare for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.